I think we'll go ahead and get started and people can join in um, as they log into the Zoom webinar. Good morning, good afternoon or evening from wherever you are joining us. Uh, I am Meredith Lehman. I'm the head of education at the Kemper Art Museum. Um, before I introduce today's speakers, I want to start by saying that we at the Kemper uh, Art Museum and Washington University stand in solidarity with the black community and the victims of racial, racial violence. George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, Nina Pop, and so many more. This is a moment for political action. And our role as a cultural institution, action means critically examining our practices and how we address or fail to address persistent institutional racism and white supremacy. As a site of cultural memory whose mission it is to preserve the past for future generations, we also have a responsibility to confront bias and inequities in the narratives and subjectivities we highlight and to be transparent about our work. A statement of equity and inclusion means nothing if not coupled with action. And we know that we have work to do to center artists, colleagues, and community members of color. This is a daily practice individually and institutionally, and we embrace this as an opportunity for growth. We will be sending out a survey following the event to get your feedback on our live programs, but we also encourage you to use this as a way to share any thoughts you have about how we can learn and grow as an institution. This is an ongoing conversation and we'd very much like to hear from you. The panelists and I discussed whether or not we should cancel today's event, but we decided to move forward with the belief that art matters and experiences with art have the potential to build and enrich communities through a shared human experience. With that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for today who have planned a wonderfully engaging conversation with us sharing their extensive research and insights into our collection of ancient Greek vases, a selection of objects that have not been as visible in our galleries as our modern and contemporary artworks, but that are widely used in teaching. Griselda McClelland, McClelland a Dean in the College Office of Arts and Sciences and lecturer in the Classics Department at Washington University in St. Louis. Tim Moore, who is the John and Penelope Biggs Distinguished Professor of Classics and who specializes in ancient Greek and Roman literature, theater, and music. And Susan Rotroff, who is the Jarvis Thurston and Mona Van Dyne Professor Emerita and a classical archaeologist specializing in the study of Greek pottery. I'll turn it over to you, Griselda, uh, Tim, and Susan. Thank you. Great. We are um, really excited and delighted to be hosting you in this conversation today about the Kemper's really remarkable collection of ancient Greek vases, which is now formally on exhibit. And we're thrilled having all of us taught with these vases frequently. Um, and I'm going to start this conversation by asking you to or inviting you to engage in a sort of an imaginative exercise for a moment with me. Um, I'd like you to, to imagine that you're strolling through, say, the Art Institute in Chicago, or perhaps the Met in New York, or even, even the St. Louis Art Museum up on the hill right by Wash U. And strolling through the Antiquities Collection, um, I imagine you have seen many vases, and perhaps in strolling past those vases, you haven't been particularly interested. Your curiosity hasn't necessarily been piqued. And maybe that has to do with the recurrent shapes or re re reoccurring colors. And maybe, maybe you've just strolled past. Maybe you haven't paused. Our hope today is that you will pause with us, that we can stop you in your stroll through the antiquities collection here at the Kemper. And so that we can show you all the riches that can be unpacked, all the cultural riches that can be unpacked from a single ancient Greek vase. Um, one thing I will note is we are more than happy to pause and take your questions throughout this conversation. We very much want this to be a conversation. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A function on the Zoom to raise them. Don't use the chat, we won't see them. And I think what we'll do is begin at the beginning. We'll start with Susan, we're gonna try to find out how these vases even ended up at Washington University. So I'm gonna share my screen and show you what we're gonna be looking at today. If I can get this going here. I think what we're gonna see here is an image that shows you how the vases are displayed today. Um, 
here on the left. Um, and as Zelly mentioned, this is very exciting because they have not been on public display throughout my time at Washington University, which is 25 years. Um, and uh, one of the great benefits of the new building is that there is space for them. So uh, you will soon be able to come and visit them. And some of the vases that you can see in these cases here are the ones that we're gonna be talking about today. Um, they were brought here uh, for the World's Fair in 1904. And after the fair closed, Robert Brookings, who <clears throat> was the chair of the um, Board of Trustees, a handsome man there on the right, um, the Brookings of Brookings Hall, the Brookings of the Bro Brookings um, Institute in New York, very prominent man in his day. Um, he and a local collector, Charles Parsons, um, provided the funds to acquire the vases for the university. So we have um, about 25 of them and another small group um, are in the St. Louis Art Museum. <clears throat> now, one thing I want to talk about is context. Um, that's a thing that archaeologists think about a lot, but we can look at it in different ways. And today we can encounter these vases in the context of a museum. They're isolated, they're separated from us by a barrier for their own protection, and this is their present day context. But their ancient context was very different. For the people who made them and used them, they were simply items of everyday use. They weren't put on pedestals um, and behind glass. They were sitting on tables. They were probably getting knocked over and broken, um, but they were part of everyday life. They were nice pottery you could use for entertaining, but they were not particularly expensive. Today, of course, they are very costly, means we insure them for tens of thousands of dollars, but an ordinary person could buy one of these. Um, and because they were part of life, the pots themselves, their sizes, their shapes, um, but also the images on the pots have a lot, of, lot to tell us about the people who use them. Um, but we have to learn how to sort of read them um, if we can use that analogy. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is one of the, um, the very first vases, the vases that we're going to begin with today. Uh, one of the, the vases that Brookings procured for, for Washington University. Um, Susan, what is it that we're, we're looking at here in light of the fact that we're, we're trying to read these vases? Yeah, well, Sally, looking is really the key word. We need to look patiently at all of the details. This is true, of course, of any work of art, but with these small scale works with a lot of detail, it's particularly important. Now this vase, as you can see, was made somewhere between 450 and 420. And this was the time of Athens' greatest political power and cultural power. Um, but it was also a, a time of a lot uh, of difficulties for the Athenians. They underwent a terrible war. They suffered through an epidemic, which the descriptions make sound a great deal worse than what we are suffering through now. Um, none of that is referred to here. We're looking at the happy side of life. The Greeks preferred to portray um, the optimal view of daily life or else mythological scenes. <clears throat> now this pot, it's too big for drinking. It's about 10 inches high. Um, so it was used to mix water and wine uh, for entertainment. The Greeks always mixed their wine with water. Um, they never drank it straight. They would be shocked at our activities. Um, and it was drunk in the context of a very special kind of entertainment it was called a symposium. A word literally means drinking together. It was a formalized drinking party. It was attended only by men, and we'll see some social um, conventions that we can comment upon on our vases. Um, women were there sometimes, but only as entertainers, not as the guests. Uh, it was after a meal, they'd finished eating, and when the meal was over, they brought out a mixing bowl like this. They made a formal decision about how much water and how much wine, which was gonna determine the nature of the party that followed. Um, and this vase shows such a party going on. So it's in the center of the party and it's also representing the party and the partiers. Oops, my phone making noise. Um, so one thing to keep in mind, the pictures aren't snapshots. 
they show us um, something of life in that day, but they are not um, absolutely veristic representations. They're ideals. Um, and typical features, however, that we can see, first of all, is the guests, instead of sitting, they are reclining on couches, very nice couches with very nice pillows that somebody has specially woven or um, embroidered. They have in front of them little tables on which the food would have been placed earlier or which they could place a wine cup if they had one. And the feet of these tables are shaped like the feet of animals. So this is fancy furniture. The general overall picture is a picture of luxury. Um, you had to have some special party skills. You had to um, be able to recline like that and um, pick up your wine cup if you had one. Um, these guys are relaxing. One guy has taken off his fancy boots and they're sitting underneath his seat. The other guy has, sat, has set his walking staff to the side. He's not lame. It was something an elegant gentleman had uh, while he walked through the city. But they aren't holding drinking cups, which is strange. We'll return to that in a moment. Um, but they are interacting. And talk was a big part of the entertainment of one of these uh, parties. It could be the lowest kind of exchange of coarse jokes, or it could be the most refined discussion of philosophy, musical performance, but there was always a very active interchange. Yes, and in fact, Plato gives us one of our most famous um, depictions of a symposium in his uh, dialogue, eponymously named The Symposium. Um, Tim, can you tell us more about this context? What is, what is the context of the symposium? What is it, the context in which these phases would have been used? And how should we as viewers understand them in light of this context? Well, one element of this context is, as Susan mentioned, entertainment. And the key part of that is music. The symposium was a profoundly musical event. And this race reflects well the varieties of music most typical of such occasions. Between the two symposiasts, a young woman plays a most intriguing instrument called an aulos, A-U-L-O-S. Though sometimes called a flute, the aulos is more like two oboes played simultaneously. That is, as you can see here, it's a pair of pipes. Each one has a double reed as its mouthpiece, which buzz to produce the instrument's sound. The aulos was everywhere in Athens, at funerals, sacrifices, processions, symposia like this one, and it was the instrument that accompanied Athenian theater. But at least in this period, many upper-class Athenians did not consider the aulos quite respectable. Hence, it is played here, you'll note, not by one of the symposiasts, but rather by an enslaved woman who has been hired for this occasion. Note the woman's puffed cheeks, typical in portrayals of aulos players. The puffed cheeks might explain in part the instrument's low status. As you can see, it wasn't terribly flattering to the player. The other instrument is called a barbitos, B-A-R-B-I-T-O-S. The barbitos is a low-pitched variation of the other most common Athenian instrument, the lyre. A lyre is similar to a harp, except that the strings of a lyre are all of the same length. Different tension causes them to produce different pitches. The lyre was as ubiquitous in Athens as the aulos was, but generally in different contexts. It was the preferred instrument for upper class education, much as the piano was in the 19th century. So it is played here, not by a hired professional, but by one of the symposiasts himself. Our two symposiasts appear to represent a typical upper class Athenian rite of passage. The bearded man on the right is probably an erastes, which translates as a lover. The unbearded man, an eromenos, translates as the beloved. In a relationship that combined mentorship, companionship, and sexuality, the older erastes helped the eromenos make his transition into adult life. So now if we were to walk 
around this vase, and someone raised the question as to where these vases are made, that the vases are all the vases that we are looking at today were produced in Athens. Um, and, and if we were to walk around this vase, Susan, as we might in the gallery itself, what would we see? Well, all pots, of course, have two sides. Um, and part of the fun is figuring out how they relate to one another. And they almost always have subjects that are in some way interrelated. So on this side, we see the next stage of this party. Um, on the first side, we saw two different levels of society. We saw the upper class or middle class people aspiring to behave like upper class people who are the partiers and the enslaved woman who entertains them. Here we have only the partiers themselves. They've been joined by a third person because two people lying down take up more space than people standing up. So we have to have, there's that artistic consideration. Um, the fellow is picking up his staff, he's walking with his staff, and they're holding their enormous wine cups. So even if that cup is partly full of water, you can see that a good deal of wine was imbibed at these activities. After the party, if the party became sufficiently raucous, the partiers might decide to take it outside and to wander around the neighborhood. Now on the most, um, so the best um, way to look at, the, the best, most flattering way uh, to consider this is that they are celebrating the power of the wine god. They themselves have imbibed the wine or the god, if you like it that way, and they have become inspired and they're out there showing off. A less attractive way to look at it is it's a display of their own power. They are the upper class or the middle class aspiring to the upper class. Um, and they're doing this because they can do it. They're showing off in the neighborhood. They're bothering everybody, maybe, um, but they don't care. Um, this is their display of power. So uh, one of the things about ancient society, ancient Athenian society, that in fact we might admire um, less than some other parts. So does anybody have questions about this particular vase? This is called a stamnos. Anybody have questions or thoughts about what they've seen so far? Okay, I'm not sure. Let's see. There's one question. What is that question? Just bear with me for one moment. We have a few coming in. Thank you for your patience. Let's see here if I can pull them up right here. I don't want to stop my sharing. Okay, here we go. Does, oh, this is a great one for you, Susan. Does a stamnos always have this shape? Let me go back to that shape that we were looking at. So we'll come back to it. This is- Yeah, these shape names are names that modern archeologists have applied to specific shapes. So yes, um, for English speaking archeologists, a stamnos has essentially this shape. The lip might look a little different. The foot might be a slightly different shape, but it would be basically this, um, this outline and it's been used. We don't know what the ancient word necessarily might have been, although stamnos is um, an ancient Greek word. It's a modern Greek word that's used for a stew pot, mm -hmm. but we, by convention, um, use it to mean this shape. So this bounces into your mind as soon as you hear the word stamnos, if you're a Greek archeologist. A couple other really great questions. Tim, I might throw this one your way. What time of day are these parties typically taking place? And, and what's our evidence for that? They're evening, uh, usually post dinner, and they could go very late into the night. Uh, our most famous symposium is Plato's Symposium, which goes right on through the night and they're doing their comos or the equivalent at dawn. That's fabulous. One last question that I have here is, and this, Susan, may, may be best posed to you. Um, who is the artist? How, how do we know who makes these, these pots and would artists ever actually attend the symposia? Would we have an artist at one of these parties? 
This is a very, very good question and something that people have puzzled over. You can see this one is said to be by the Kensington Painter. It's a modern nickname. Uh, most of the vases are not signed by the makers, but they have distinctive styles. It's generally a distinctive way of painting an ear, the toes, the hands, and they can be brought together and we can be pretty sure they were painted by one person, although we have no name. So names are picked um, often because there happens to be a vase in a particular collection, um, and so they'll get a nickname. So this is a nickname vase, Kensington Painter. Some people even call it the Kensington Group because they're not really sure they're all by the same person. Um, as for who the painters were, they were craftsmen, they were probably not Athenians, most of them. Some of them have names that show they were foreigners. Um, some of them were probably slaves. Some of them were free, uh, but we don't know too much about them. There is one group of them who painted pictures of themselves at symposiums. And the question has always been whether they really were at symposiums or they just were kind of laughing at the rich guys who commissioned their works and thought, well, we can paint ourselves at the symposium. We don't know, um, but it's possible that they did uh, participate, throw some parties for themselves. Great, okay. Well, with specific consideration of these two figures here, I'd like to introduce our next pot. This is by a fellow who's been called Hermitax, the Nolan Amphora. And I wonder if our, our visitors, especially if I toggle to this next image, might be able to guess at what is being depicted here. Does anyone have any idea? If we think about the two figures who appeared on the couches, does anybody out there in the audience have a thought about what this face, just from your, your, this first glance, might be depicting? If not, I think I will turn this over to Tim and see if Tim can clarify the conjunction between our earlier symposium vase and this Nolan Amphora. It looks, Zoe, as if in fact we have another example here of the Erastes, the lover, and the Eromanes, the beloved. Because here it looks as if an older man on the left pursues a younger, again unbearded. And it looks as if he's hoping the young man will become his Eromanos. Just as in Greek mythology, the king of the gods, Zeus, once snatched the Trojan youth Ganymede and brought him up to Olympus. A standard expectation of the Erastes Eromanos relationship was that the youth would play hard to get. Note, though, that the youth looks back at his pursuer, not away. away. He seems to be interested. On the opposite side of the vase is another Eromanos in a not too determined flight, presumably from the potential Erastes. Like the youth in our first face, he carries a lyre, a symbol of the cultural education he undergoes. Here we can see the parts of the lyre especially well, better than we could in the Barbatos earlier. Uh, if you take a look at the lyre, note that its sound box was made of a shell of a tortoise. It had seven strings usually, and it also has a strap, which helped the, the player hold the instrument. So now there's something really striking about this vessel that I'm hoping, Susan, you can clarify for us. As we said from the outset, these vases are all made in Athens or in Attica, which is another way to describe the city-state of Athens. And yet we call this amphora the Nolan amphora. And Nola was an Etrurian city all the way across the Mediterranean in Italy, quite close to Pompeii. So the question this raises, of course, then, is why this vessel with very rich, really Athenian cultural significance shows up in Southern Italy. And so I, I ask that of you, Susan, why, why is that happening? Um, well, this brings up another really interesting aspect of context. Uh, we talked about the context of the vases today, their context in ancient life, but there's also their archeological context, which is to say, where did we find them? Um, 
And most of the ones that are complete were in fact found in graves and usually in Etruscan graves, graves of this still somewhat mysterious, mysterious Italian people um, who lived in Italy, as Zelly said. Um, we have not deciphered their script, so we can't read their language. Uh, we know them mostly from their architecture and their art, um, but they were very, very enthusiastic about Greek pottery. Um, a large proportion of what we have today, therefore, comes from their tombs. And this amphora still contains traces of ash, traces of the cremated remains of its owner. So we know that it was used as a funeral urn. But these vases also show traces of wear. The undersides are worn. Sometimes they've been broken and put back together again. So they were first used in the homes of the Etruscans before they were put in the tombs. Why did the Etruscans love this pottery so much? We don't know, um, but the shapes and the decorations clearly appealed to them as they do to many of us. Uh, they probably read them in a very different way. They had their own stories, they had their own myths, they had their own social customs. For instance, their wives had dinner with them at parties, unlike the Athenians, where only the men dined together. But um, it's hard to say what they saw in the scenes. And it could even be one of the reasons that the Greek painters sometimes left the subject matter somewhat vague. This would be more appealing to perhaps the Etruscan customer. So we've got a couple of really great questions that have been coming in, and I think we'll pause here to answer them. I have a wonderfully insightful question from the daughter of one of our viewers, and she's cutting right to the heart of the matter. Tim, why is it that Greeks don't appear to wear underwear? <laughs> and could you clarify perhaps something of the significance of the clothes they do wear, perhaps maybe something about these garments here for our viewers? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, one of the most striking things about Greek vases is that more often than not, the male figures are naked. Uh, the reason for that appears to be that nudity for a male in ancient Athens was considered glorifying. Hence, gods, heroes, are almost always presented naked. So to present your person as nude on the vase elevates that person to a higher level. It's so almost like some kind of special crown or adornment we might put on a person today. In terms of the clothing, what we see here are variations of a kind of clothing somebody might wear, a kind of cloak. Garments tended to hang over your shoulders in ancient Greece. And here they've given us the chance for the artist to show off the artist's skill of making clothing and at the same time not cover up the bodies so that the cloaks hang around on the shoulders, visible in themselves, but not covering anything of significance. Yeah, I could add that, you know, I said that these aren't snapshots and people didn't walk around Athens without any clothes on. They did exercise in the gymnasium in the nude, but like us, when they were going about their business, they were clothed. So this is a very specific statement, as, um, as, as Tim said, not a, fo uh, a photograph of what the world looked like. Yeah, it's an idealization and a real celebration of the ideal male citizen right here. Um, so now we have a couple questions that are slightly more technical, Susan, that I'd like to turn to you before we move to uh, another vase. Um, and these are also uh, great, great questions. Um, the very first is, can you comment a little bit, and I'm not sure if our, our, our um, the, the individual who's raising this question is commenting about this phase or an earlier phase, but might you comment a little bit about the decorations, the banded decorations that occur on the vase and you, what, how they might be useful to an archeologist, um, the, these bands, these decorative motifs. Um, and then also, could you, could you tell us whether the painter also constructed these vases or were there distinct roles in the creation of these vases? Um, well, to take the second question first, which is easier, um, in many cases, there was a separate person potting and painting. Um, but there are also cases in which the same person potted and painted. And we know this because we have signatures 
that in some cases say so-and-so potted it and a different so-and-so painted it, but we occasionally have um, inscriptions on the vases that say so-and-so both painted and potted it. Um, and this seems to have changed over time. Um, in the early sixth century, when the industry was getting started, there were a lot of kind of one-man show potteries that uh, the same person was the master potter and the decorator of the vases. And then as this industry became um, more um, successful, uh, the pottery workshops perhaps became larger. You might have one entrepreneur potter um, who hired various different people to decorate the vases that he potted. So many of them were um, a joint effort. Um, as for the decorative bands, you know, not too many people study those because when you look at this, what's interesting? The figures. So everybody wants to study the figures and not many people turn their attention to the bands. Um, but the band decoration does seem to be typical of certain workshops. So it does tell us something about that. Um, it, but it's, as you can see, it's not very carefully done. It probably was handed over to an apprentice to, to add. To, um, and so it doesn't um, work like, say, you know, a branding device or something like that that helps us to identify different workshops. Um, but it can be a hint along with some of the other things. They were highly conventionalized patterns, I should also say. Right. Um, Tim, looking at this image here and considering the, the Kensington Stamnos with its instruments earlier, one of our, one of our um, attendees is asking the question as to whether or not we have contemporary recordings of these kinds of instruments. What, do we know how they might have sounded? We do. And in fact, we know much more now than we did as little as 15, 20 years ago because the study of ancient Greek music has become very, very exciting in the last years. And a number of people have reconstructed music played on reconstructions of these instruments. There's always controversy. We only have some, some archeological remains. We have very little written music. And of course, we don't have recordings from antiquity. But if you go to YouTube now and search for ancient Greek music, you will find a considerable number of interpretations of people playing lyres, playing alloy, sometimes singing along as well. It's well worth uh, an afternoon of surfing to find this ancient Greek music. Fabulous. So, so far, we've really been looking at um, these vases as uh, containers for wine. Before we move to our next phase, I wanna, I wanna look, consider two more questions that have come up for us. The first, Susan, is these don't look like they would be necessarily ideal for pouring. And certainly they would raise the question about drinking. How, how would they be easy to use in terms of pouring? Would there have been a ladle? How would you have transferred wine from a stamina, so a mixing bowl of this kind to, um, to an actual cup? Yeah, you would probably have had a dipper of some kind. Um, and these frequently would have been made of metal. So very few of them survive, although we do have some clay dippers. Um, so no, neither of these would be good for pouring. The Nolan Amphora, which was probably for holding um, unmixed wine to be mixed together in the crater, could be poured out. You might pour the whole thing out. You know, we're gonna have one whole Amphora worth of wine and three Amphora's worth of water in our mixing bowl. So you wouldn't need to do any very neat and precise pouring, just kind of dumping into your mixing bowl. Okay. Well, this brings me to our next pot, and I'm going to raise this question in conjunction with this next pot. Here we have um, the cup. We've been looking at all these containers for wine, but how do we actually party with it without a cup? So we finally have an example of a cup, and I am gonna have Susan talk about that shape, but one of our viewers very astutely has been asking about black and red and what is glazed and what is not glazed. And so I think it might be useful at this moment to pause and pay some attention to these figures and the glaze or lack thereof. and and. I wonder if, if people out in the audience can see some essential difference between these sets of figures. And I'm wondering if Susan can tell us why that matters and, um, 
and, and what it can tell us about the dates of these cups and, and the different techniques, you know, addressing this question about glazes? Well, the question that was asked shows that people have already focused in on this question. There are two main styles that we've been looking at. One we call black figure because the figures are black, like this one, and the other we call red figure because the figures are red, as in this one. Um, so not very inventive names, but easy to remember. And the black figure style began first, um, and the parts that are black on all of these vases are the parts that have glaze. So you painted the design on a vase like this, a black figure uh, vase, by painting that figure with your little pot of slip or diluted clay that would eventually turn black when the pot was fired. The black figure style was very much more formal, um, much less naturalistic, um, because of course the Greek skin tone was not black. They were Mediterranean people with a kind of olive skin. So uh, they didn't look like this. Sometimes white was used for women's faces and arms, um, but it's a rather formal and stylized. Now, if we look at the other style, um, if you can zip over to that, Zelly, um, it's the opposite. What is painted here is the background. So that may be why it took them a while to get around to this idea of how to paint a more naturalistic figure. You have to not paint it. You have to paint its background, and then you add the details within. So this makes the vessel, uh, the figure, more like what an ancient Greek looked like in terms of skin tone, and it also made it possible to use shading. Um, and along with that went developments towards more naturalized positions, um, uh, more variety in the way one could depict the hair, for instance, and things like that. So, and there is a chronological difference. The black figure is primarily of the sixth century BC when Athens was not a, a big mover and shaker. Um, she was an up and coming large city state, but not the top of the heap yet. Um, whereas the red figure is primarily of the fifth century um, where Athens had become uh, more of a world power. Now, um, I should mention something also about this shape. We finally have a drinking cup. And this was one of the most typical drinking cup shapes. It's different from the cup we saw um, on our Stamnos. Um, it's wide and on a high foot, so quite elegant like our own stemware and with two handles. Um, it would have taken some practice to learn how to drink out of a cup like this, how to balance it. They very often balance the cup on one hand. They put the foot on one hand and balanced it that way. So you had to learn your party manners. Um, but this particular cup is extremely large. Um, it's about 10 inches in diameter. And you think about how much that would weigh when it was full of liquid. It would be pretty unwieldy for actual drinking. Um, so what was it really used for? Was it really a drinking cup? Um, it could have been a drinking cup used for a drinking contest. They had drinking contests at the symposia. And in fact, to be able to drink a lot and not become drunk was an ancient virtue, um, both among the Greeks and other ancient peoples as well. Um, or it might really be too big for practical use. It might have been a gift for a divinity, for instance. Um, and because it's whole, it probably was found in a grave. So it could even have been made specifically as a grave gift, although I think that's probably unlikely. So now I'd like, I'd like you to imagine you're a, a drinker at one of these parties and you're quaffing off your last sip of wine and you peer down inside and into the base of this cup. The base is called the Tondo. And suddenly there's this shock as you drain your cup and you confront this image at the base of your cup. Tim, what is it that, that, the, that the drinker is looking at here? Well, if in fact this is a drinking cup, it's one of the great jokes of the symposium because you would drink a lot of wine to empty this cup. And then underneath the dark wine, when it's drained, you would suddenly see this and say, oh my God, I think I've been drinking a little more than I should have. Because <laughs> what you see is a creature called a chimera who combined features of a lion and a goat and a serpent. 
Here, as you can see, the goat grows right out of the lion's back. The snake is usually the tail of the lion, but it looks as if the artist ran out of room, and therefore the snake is chopped off. Famously in Greek mythology, the chimera was slain by the hero Bellerophon in the story that's told in Homer's Iliad, the epic poem about the Trojan War. So now we've, we've mentioned this idea of reading, reading vases, you know, conjoining side A to side B in some way, that there's a conversation between these. How would an ancient viewer begin to reconcile what seems to be the pretty disparate imagery that we see on this phase, where we have this Iliadic Trojan War scene on the outside of warriors confronting, and then on the inside, the, the, the monster that Bellerophon defeated. What, what are we to make of this? If, if it's possible, Tim, is there a way to construct something that could make sense, or maybe the ancient viewer could construct something? What, what would that be? But just possible, Zoe, the outside of this vase recalls the moment in the Iliad when the story of the Chimera is told. In that story, two warriors, one fighting on the Greek side, one on the Trojan side, meet in battle, but they share their respective genealogies before they fight each other. And they learn that they're both, in fact, descended from Bellerophon, the guy that killed the Chimera. Once they find that out, they decide not to fight, they exchange their armor, and head on their separate ways. Fabulous. So I have a, before we move to our, our next phase, and people, please feel free to, to, to share questions. We've got a couple here. Um, one individual, Phil, is wondering if we know how, and Susan, this might be best directed to you, if we know how vase producers achieved the shiny um, quality of the black vases and the less shiny sort of oxidized red surfaces, next to each other. Um, this apparently is very hard to do, says Phil, and he's wondering how, how this was accomplished in antiquity. Yeah, it is very hard to do, and um, there really were, in modern times, um, decades if not centuries of experimentation to try to figure out how it was done, um, and we think we now pretty much know um, the black part is all the glaze, and the glaze um, it's not a glaze in the modern sense, it's really a slip, it's a solution of the clay. Um, because of the way they fired the pots in the kiln in a complex three-stage firing process, that slip turned black and became shiny. Um, the surface of that slip sintered um, or sort of fused together uh, when the kiln reached its greatest temperature. What's left uncovered by the glaze turns clay color. I mean, it's oxidized. There's a three-stage firing process that's complicated, but at one point they remove the oxygen from the kiln. They, they cover up the, the inflow so that it's a reducing atmosphere, so the whole pot turns black. Um, but when they let oxygen back in again, only the pot, the um, clay that's not covered by glaze can turn back red again. It's kind of hard to describe it. Um, but it, it was a kind of magical process. They discovered this as early as the Bronze Age, though. They've probably did, been doing this uh, since about the year 2000 BC. Um, but they brought it to a high art with the black and red figure pottery. And it took us until the early 20th century to, to figure out more or less how they were doing it. Um, so, uh, a couple more questions, <laughs> if, if, you know, if, if we have time. Um, I would like to know whether the ancient Greek wine, or this, not I, but this um, viewer would like to know whether the ancient Greek wine was somehow stronger than the modern wine. And I, I think, did you mention that wine was never, um, you know, consumed just straight, Susan? I can't recall if we said that at the top. Um, it, it can't be stronger because they didn't know about distillation. They didn't know how to distill alcohol. So there's a limit to how, um, as I understand it, not being a winemaker, um, there's a limit to how much alcoholic content you can have because at a certain level, the alcohol content uh, kills the yeast and it stops the fermentation pro process. I myself have wondered whether they might have actually used freezing instead of distillation to make a more potent uh, drink like Applejack. And there were some Northern wines that were supposed to be very, very strong. 
Um, but that is completely my own fevered brain. I have no scientific support for that idea. But it was pretty much the strength of, of modern wines. Modern wine. um, another question, uh, again, Susan, this is for you. Uh, what do we know about when um, or who invented red figure? I mean, when did this, do we know how red figure came along? We, we know the sixth century is predominantly black figure. Who was the artist? Was there a group? Was there a school to whom we could ascribe the invention of the red figure, that naturalistic style that we see come to, you know, fruition later in the sixth century? Yeah, well, there is an artist who's associated with the earliest vases, um, a man who worked with a potter named Andocides. So he's called the Andocides painter. Um, and he was active, there's controversy, some people say as early as 530, I personally say more like around 510 or 515. Um, but he and a small group were the first ones to experiment with this. Um, and then there came a second generation of people who we call the pioneers because they really went to town with it and explored all of the possibilities. These were the men who painted pictures of themselves at the party. Um, so they were a very inventive and seemingly fun-loving bunch of guys. But we can place it within a group of artisans, some of them nameless, um, but with strong personalities artistically. Very, very, very cool. Um, okay, so I'm not sure if our audience has noted this yet. And this also, we have one more question that's gonna be a perfect segue, so I'm gonna place it as we move into our next phase. But most of the figures we've been looking at on all of these bases have been decidedly male, right? Most of our imagery has featured these male figures centrally. And I don't think this is particularly surprising given the status of the adult male citizen in ancient Athens. Um, but what this does do for us is make the representation of women perhaps more striking when we do come upon the representation of a woman, um, particularly as they are on equal social subjects in, in ancient Athens. So how do we see women appear in sympotic iconography and this raises or ties into a question that one of our viewers has asked in general. How can we look at the, the clothing, the distinctive clothing that appear um, that appears on some of these vases and how can that clothing perhaps cue us into social status? Um, we had spoken earlier about those cloaks uh, that they, they use or, and young men were wearing and we'll certainly look closely at the clothes that appear on this small vase that we're turning to now. Um, Susan, what, what can we glean from this, this vase? Can you tell us both about the, the vase itself, its shape, and, and the woman who strikingly appears on it? Um, well, as you can all see, it's a little jug, um, an oinakui, which literally means a wine pourer. Uh, and it's well designed for pouring if you look at the elaborately formed rim, uh, so-called kind of a cloverleaf shape or trefoil shape. Um, and it's quite a delicate little vase. It would have held wine, unmixed wine, that could be poured into a mixing bowl. Um, it's quite small. It's about eight inches high. So it's a delicate little thing. And then if we look at the details of it, uh, the painting on it is delicate as well. And it, uh, it seems to me like a very feminine vase. So, um, if we look at a close-up, we have a heavily clothed woman, and women, unless they were prostitutes, are shown as clothed. A nice woman does not show off her body. Um, so this woman is wearing her undergarment, it's usually called a chiton, which is a thin linen garment, and then over it she has draped an animal skin. And this is not <clears throat> the normal everyday dress. So she is dressed in a special costume that has to do with religious activity <clears throat> that she's involved in. So she has the animal skin. You can see the kuf up at the top of this poor little um, fawn. Um, and she's holding a staff, which has, you can just barely make out some leaves attached to it and branches. And these, <clears throat> sorry, 
<clears throat> it's an allergy time of year. Um, these details identify her as a devotee of the god Dionysus, as a menad or a bacchant. And these women participated in a particular rite of dance. They went out into nature, and nature is identified for us or cued by the huge buds that surround her. Not realistic, but they tell us that she's out in the natural world. They also refer to the bounty of Dionysus and fertility, um, and they danced ecstatically, rather like the whirling dervishes um, of the Sufi um, of the Sufis. They made contact with the god by this repetitive whirling motion, and they did this, as I say, out in nature, far away from the city and far away from men. This was a private female right. Now. Athenian women lived rather sequestered lives. Some people have said they were never supposed to go out at all. Some people have claimed that they were veiled. We really don't know, but they certainly didn't wander around the town freely. Um, but rituals like this allowed them to go outside to participate with other women in religious activities. And they also were contributing to the well being of the community because the community needs the god Dionysus. He's a god of fertility. He makes those vines grow so that the men can harvest the grapes and make their wine to have their symposia. So it's all part of one package and the women are um, intensely participating in this. So this, this Maynard figure then is, is clearly closely associated in ritual with, with the, the god Dionysus, who, who we know from Tim is the, the god of wine. He's also the god of theater. And both wine and theater have the capacity to deeply alter human perception of what is real, of reality. Tim, for you, um, does the Maynard uh, evoke any particular myths that capture the more terrible aspect of, of, uh, of Dionysian power, the, the power to distort reality, or myths that maybe really capture or underscore the terrible faultiness of human perception? looking at this phase. Well, she recalls especially the Bacchae, a tragedy of the tragedian Euripides. Uh, in that story, Pentheus, the king of Thebes, refuses to allow the worship of Dionysus. When the women like this one go out into the hills to dance, he tries to bring them back forcibly. Dionysus ends up tricking him and he goes out in disguise and ends up torn to pieces by his own mother who has been beset by frenzy by Dionysus and become a Minad like this one. A very terrifying tale of what happens when one resists Dionysus. So what I want to pause and underscore for our audience, what, what's so striking about this little tiny Oino Koi is that this singular image could possibly evoke in an ancient viewer and now for us can evoke real life ritual practice the poetry of Euripides, the nature of theater, um, and the, the place of real women in Attic society. Um, it's hardly surprising then that myth, which, which is mythology, which is really equally multivalent, informs so much of the iconography that we see on Attic vases. And isn't it true, Susan, I think this is really fascinating, we're looking at Athenian vases, that the Athenian painters were the first to put humans, mortal heroes, mortals, um, on their pots. And, and uh, you know, Athenian heroes are among the first, along with Heracles, to, to appear on these pots. Um, and, and maybe this captures the intense pride um, and promotion of the city that um, Athenians were prone to, to engage in. Um, in this last pot, I'm wondering, um, this last pot that, or this next pot that we're going to look at, the Amphora by the long-nosed painter, I'm wondering if we can, we can see an aspect of the chauvinism at work. Um, this is the, is the, is the long-nosed painter Amphora, and I want to underscore again, we're looking at a black figure, Amphora, so we know this is going to be from the, the sixth century based on this black figure. Um, it's an older vase. Tim, what, would you be able to expand on this imagery for us? I'm gonna move into something a bit closer, but I'm wondering if our audience, in looking at this figure here, and in a moment I'll show you in more detail, what are we looking at? We, we might guess 
that this is Cerberus and, and why the heck does he have two heads? What is it, and I'll move now to more detail, what is it that we're looking at here, Tim? What we see here is probably the greatest task of the greatest of the Greek heroes, Heracles. Heracles is most known for his 12 labors. And the last and surely most difficult of those was that he had to go down to Hades, to the underworld, and bring back up Cerberus, the dog who guarded the palace of the king of the underworld. And what we find here on the far left is Heracles himself. You can recognize him by his lion skin that he almost always wears. In front of him, we see that it's not at all unusual for a god to help out heroes in their labors. This is the god Hermes. You can recognize him from his hat. And he seems to be patting the dog whom he's helped Heracles placate very well. Behind Cerberus are Hades, the king of Hades, and his wife, the queen of Hades, Persephone. Cerberus's two heads indicate to us that Greek myth is not a sacred text, but a story that can change based on an artist's desires. So, sticking with our reading of pots and getting to this idea of Athenian chauvinism, Susan, what is on the back of this pot? Okay, there are two sides, side A and side B, like a record. Um, and one is usually better than the other. So this is side B of this pot, very quickly sketched out, um, but nonetheless with a recognizable subject. There's another hero confronting a monster. Uh, this very strange looking monster over on the right is the so-called Minotaur, the bull of Minos, um, a hybrid monster with the head of a bull very poorly represented bull, but a bull, and he has a tail as well. Um, he was confronted by the Athenian hero Theseus. It's a, um, a labor a bit like Heracles' visit to the underworld because it involved sailing across the sea to the remote island of Crete and then entering a maze, entering the labyrinth, at the center of which was this death-dealing monster. So Theseus too is confronting death and winning his fight with the monster. And when the Athenians put these two subjects on either side of a vase, they're telling us that their hero is just as good as Heracles. Everybody knew Heracles was absolutely the greatest Greek hero, except in Athens they knew that Theseus was just as great. Theseus was a local boy and his bones were actually buried in Athens, in the center of the city, so that he was always there, powerful, and protecting them. So it's a nice example of Athenian chauvinism. Nobody felt bad about saying their city was absolutely the best, and the Athenians were very, very good at saying that. Great. I'm not sure if we have any other questions about this particular vase. I can slowly <clears throat> go back and show you the full vase. And if anybody would like me to pause and go back to any of the other vases, I'm more than happy to do that, to show you their full forms. We've, we've had several close-ups so that you can really see the iconography clearly here. Um, but if not, I'm not seeing any at the moment. I think what we'll do is we'll, we'll move on to this one final vase, um, sort of starting or ending where we began. This here is, is another stemnos, and I, I've given you the, the small maenad oenokoi so you can see just how large and, and, and rather just how small um, each of these vases are respectively. Um, and, and we're returning to this, this shape here with real intention, and I, I, I call you back to your stroll through the museum and, and how profitable it can be to pause and really consider a vase again and again. Um, and we, we've, we've chosen this last phase to underscore that point. This phase for a long time um, was, was considered quite straightforward. Um, uh, how, was that, how was that understanding transformed by closer and closer scrutiny, Susan? What, what happened with this stamnos? Well, this is another mixing bowl. Um, it's the largest one in the collection, but as Sally said, maybe it looks kind of dull. If there's no painted decoration on it that you can see. Um, it replicated ancient metal vases, which were often used at the symposium. Um, 
and it was brought here as a nice example of an all-black stamnos. They're relatively rare. There aren't that many of them. And so it remained. And then shortly after I came to Washington University in the middle of the 1990s, um, I invited a colleague to come and see our collection uh, because he hadn't been able to see it. And he's an eminent scholar of vase painting. And so we got the vases out and we looked at them very, very carefully. And then to our surprise on this vase, we saw something no one had ever noticed before. On the shoulder of this vase was the image of a scorpion. Now, let me make a slight aside at this point. You'll also see a lot of fingerprints, <laughs> dust and dirt on this vase. Um, this is what happens if you don't carefully curate a vase. These vases have been here for 100 years and they weren't always as carefully guarded as they are today. Now we never would touch the surface with our fingers, which have oils on them and leave fingerprints. And you can see plenty of that here. I am happy to tell you that the vases are now undergoing a program of conservation and cleaning. Um, and so this, this is an old photograph because we don't have new photographs of the vases in their new, um, in their new um, cleaned, state, but I wanted to assure you that the museum is taking very good care of this vessel and making sure that it is as its best. But um, to get back to the image, we saw this image very, very faint on the shoulder of the vase. This image was painted with clay on top of the, of the glaze. And that technique, which was used from time to time, particularly in the late sixth and early fifth century, uh, doesn't last very well. It looks very nice when you first do it. The scorpion here was probably either bright white or bright red, and he would have looked quite a lot like a real scorpion. He's pretty much life-size, and he might have been painted as a little joke, like wouldn't it be a shock to see a scorpion on your base? It's scorpion country there in Greece, so it wouldn't be impossible. Or um, it might be a protective device. You can take any monstrous scary thing like a snake and make it into a protective device. Put it on your shield, for instance, or make an image of it into a piece of jewelry that would protect you. So this could be a scorpion protecting the wine from adulteration or protecting the drinkers. But that's what we thought when we looked at it 25, 30 years ago. And then we looked at it again, maybe 10 years ago, and we said, there's something funny here. This scorpion has antennae. Do scorpions have antennae? We go and we look in the field guides, no antennae on the scorpions. He is playing the alloy. He's playing a musical instrument. So Tim, this is suddenly your specialty. Well, here we are again, back where we started in some ways with our Allos player and its uh, low reputation. I can tell you from very hard experience that it's really, really hard to play the Allos. But our painters suggested, well, even a scorpion can play it. <laughs> so we've all been talking at you quite a bit for a time now. And I, I think what we'd like to do as we wrap up our conversation, which has been so fun, I hope you've enjoyed it, is, is to turn it over to you for any maybe more general questions. If you want me to uh, go back to a slide, I'd be more than happy to do that. I already have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, don't hesitate to, to stay as long as you like and ask us um, questions and we'll answer them as best as we can. Um, one of the general questions that we received sort of midway through the talk was um, regarding waterproofing. Are these vases waterproof? To a degree. Um, okay. They are made of clay, so they are porous to a certain degree. Um, the glaze retards seepage, um, but if you were to fill them up with water and leave them for days and days, the water would gradually seep out. Partly it would be evaporation, but it could also seep through the wall. 
Um, but most of them were not for the long-term storage of liquids. So they were sufficiently waterproof for the length of a symposium. You would not have noticeable loss of your wine and water uh, during that um, activity. Mm -hmm. Another really interesting um, question that's been raised, and I think it's an important question. Um, it's a question that's been uh, on museums' minds certainly a lot uh, regarding antiquities. We know, of course, that Brookings donated the vases, but one of our attendees is very curious as to, to the, the actual provenance. How, how much do we know about where the vases come, come from, how they were sourced? Um, can we have a clear conscience looking at these vases? Um, yeah, we can have a clear conscience because uh, there's been a convention that um, there's sort of an amnesty for everything acquired before the 1970s when there was a UNESCO convention about trying to make sure you were not acquiring vases that had been stolen, that had been illicitly excavated and so forth. These vases uh, are grandfathered. They were acquired in 1904. So we can have a clear conscience. What we can't have is any information because we don't know where they were excavated. They were probably found in tombs in Italy. They were probably acquired from a dealer in Italy, but records of what happened over a hundred years ago, how they got into the museum, which was not then the Kemper Museum. Um, it was a different entity altogether and neither um, SLAM nor the Kemper has records that tell us anything we can just assume that they did come from a dealer in Italy and probably largely from Etruscan tombs. Mm -hmm. Another interesting question, and it's something that I raised maybe at the outset when we talk about seeing these vases in larger museum collections were typically drawn, and I think certainly in the 19th century, most archeologists and art historians were drawn to the, to the fabulous sort of statues and architecture of ancient Greece. Is it, is it possible in looking at these vases to make, to make some important connections between, between the figures that we see on vases and, and the figures we see and the motifs that we see in other forms of Greek art, perhaps more elevated forms of, of, of Greek art? Um, yeah, they were all living in the same artistic world and the vase painters were looking at sculpture and were taking ideas from sculpture. At the same time, um, you don't make much of an economical investment in designing something on a vase. So the vase painters may have been trying out new artistic ideas that the sculptors then adopted. So there was a give and take and there are stylistic similarities, um, we believe, between vases that were painted um, at the same time. Uh, we can also say, see things like hairstyles, which will be the same on vases and in sculpture, um, clothing conventions. So yeah, there's a give and take there between the, the different arts. Mm -hmm. Were any of these vessels stained on the inside from wine? You mentioned that there was the residue of ashes in the Nolan Amphora or in, in the Stamnos, the Kensington Stamnos at the outset. Um, what, is there any evidence of the wine? Um, wine doesn't leave much trace to the naked eye, but um, over the last 20, 30 years, um, scientists have been developing ways of analyzing the residue in vases. It's not visible to us, but they can take samples from the pottery and to a certain degree identify what was in the pot. The problem is that the material in the pot is usually organic material and over two or 3,000 years, it undergoes transformations. So if, let us say, there was olive oil in a pot, you're not going to find olive oil. You're going to find the products of its disintegration, and then you have to think your way back to what these products originally were. Um, so there's, but that science is progressing a lot right now. So we're, we're learning um, a lot. Uh, Tim, going back to our Aulos player and our scorpion playing the Aulos, um, why scorpions? Are there literary references we should be aware of with regard to scorpions? Um, Susan did mention that Greece is a scorpion 
habitat, um, what, what, why, why would it be construed as a low skill animal? The scorpion itself is not so much low skilled, but it seems to join a whole group of animals who are shown playing alloy, some of which do have this kind of reputation. For example, we have a number of artistic portrayals of monkeys playing alloy. And there are, in fact, a lot of suggestions of if you're a monkey, you're stupid and things like that. And perhaps most bizarrely, we have a number of portrayals of dolphins playing alloy. Now, dolphins aren't thought of being stupid. They're thought of being quite smart, but they don't have any hands. and <laughs> They're playing alloy as well. Yeah. Fascinating. That's fascinating. And the other thing about uh, a scorpion is all the ancient texts tell us that scorpions are absolutely evil and they spend all their time sitting around figuring out how to attack people. <laughs> they have no other life beyond their enmity uh, towards us. So they're, they're very good people to get on your side. You know, and you often see images of warriors with scorpions on their shields because they're, they're the ultimate attack creature. Yeah. I, any other questions out there from the audience or any particular vases you, you might want me to scroll back to? All right. So now I have a, a really interesting general question. How do we figure out, and this will maybe take one more question after this. How do we, how do we know, how, how do we know everything we're, we're, we're telling our audience today? Are we, what is our evidence for making the claims that we're making about this iconography? How do we know this isn't just storytelling of a kind? Are there ancient books that give us that support our, our, our contentions today? Well, hundreds of years of looking at the vessels and thousands of scholars making tiny steps and drawing conclusions about small things, um, challenged by other scholars who then attempt to make their own better explanations. Um, and it's a give and take among the different people who are looking at the vases, um, scholars, students, um, interested lay people are all contributing to the mix um, as we gradually try to work it out. And I asked a scholar once about a particular series of objects she was working on. And I said, well, how do you know that your theory of how these go together is right? And she said, well, it keeps working. Mm -hmm. So whenever a new piece of information comes up, it fits my model. And when a new piece of information comes up that doesn't fit the model, then we have to go back to the drawing board and try to adjust. So it's a process of constant learning, constant observation, um, and constant adjustment. And how can we know for sure? Um, if you want to know for sure, you, you know, you can't be in, in the field of archaeology. Uh, we don't have that kind of hard-edged certainty that you know, I look at mathematics and I guess two and two are four, although the mathematicians say not always. Um, but uh, we have to be comfortable with a certain amount of ambiguity. And I, th I think just to, to wrap it up, Tim, maybe you could just provide a, a little insight in terms of the, the ancient texts that inform at least the mythological representations we're, we're talking about here. Yes, as Susan mentioned, we have stunningly little specifically talking about things like techniques of vases. But we do have a wonderful amount of ancient literature talking about lots of other things, some of which we've mentioned today. The set of Greek tragedies, which refer to many of these elements of life and mythology as well. The epics of Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey. Uh, historians like Thucydides, who described the, the uh, epidemic that Susan mentioned at the beginning and various other authors ranging from Galen and his medical writers. So the study of Greek and Latin can get us connected to those which can provide all sorts of insights, not only into the basis, but into all elements of ancient Greek and Roman life. Awesome. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation with everyone today and just a real, um, real thrill to, to be sharing these objects and, and knowing that they're out on exhibition at the Kemper Museum. I hope everybody will be able to go see them in person um, in the not too distant future. So thank you.